So in today's class, we'll talk about the cost of capital. And this is probably material you've not already seen in FM, so now we are getting into something relatively new. Okay, first of all, let's just understand the term capital. You will hear this term capital used in many different contexts. So as smart business school students, you need to understand from the context what people are talking about. You will hear the term financial capital. You will sometimes hear intellectual capital, knowledge capital. You will hear uh, capital, like human capital. Sometimes capital is used to talk about plant, equipment, machinery. Basically, that would be called physical capital. Okay. If you go to a bank, when a bank talks about capital, they are talking about the money that has been put in by the owners. So they are referring to the equity that people have put in as capital. Okay. In this context, when we talk about capital, we are really talking about something called financial capital, which means essentially money. Okay. And why is there a deep link between financial capital and physical capital? Physical capital being property, plant, equipment, etc. What's the link between? Exactly. So to, to, to buy the physical capital, you need financial capital. So there is obviously a very close link. Now, all companies need capital. Okay. They need, if they want to set up a plant, if they need to buy new equipment, to pay employees, money is needed. All right. So that money can then be spent on whatever the company needs to do. This is really simplistic, just getting you warmed up. So companies need to raise capital if they are doing new projects. Okay. So building a new plant, producing a new product. If the, if a company wants to buy another company, acquire another company that requires capital. Okay. So, so obviously there is a need for capital. The next question is for this capital and right now we are going to talk about capital, uh, long term capital. What does that mean? We are going to focus on the need for long term investments. What do we mean by that? A company needs money to pay its employees, suppliers, etc. Right now we will assume that those are short term needs. And those short term needs are fulfilled by the regular operation of a business. A company that makes shoes will sell shoes, make that money and use that money to pay employees, pay for the raw material, etc, etc. But what if the company wants to expand into the into a slightly different business? So now they also want to make leather belts, for example, for that they need a new plant. How will they raise money for that new plant? Okay, broadly speaking, there are three ways in which a company can raise more capital. Either it can issue debt. Okay, so, so this money that is needed for a longer term investment, that money is called long term capital. Okay, and what are the sources of that long term capital? Three broad sources. Number one, long term debt. Number two, preferred stock. Number three, common stock. Okay, let's just get into each one of these and then we'll talk about these in detail. Long term debt, this is where a company basically borrows money. Okay, what is the fancy term for how a company borrows money? We basically say the company issues a bond. So if I'm the company, I am the owner of a shoe manufacturer and I want to start a new plant where I will manufacture leather belts, for example. One way of my raising money is to borrow from investors. Okay, let's say all of you are investors. So what I will say to you is, I will give you this piece of paper, which is essentially a bond contract, where I'm promising you that for each piece of paper, you give me, say, a thousand dollars. And I promise you that over the next 10 years, I will give you 10% coupon or 10% interest. And then after 10 years, I will return the $1,000 to you. Okay, so effectively, what am I doing? Effectively, I am, I'm uh, borrowing the $1,000 and I'm paying you uh, a rate because you are lending me your money. And this is called a bond. It's 
it's essentially a a contract it's essentially my the company is borrowing from you the investor do you realize that you are called an investor here why are you, why are you an investor you you have invested your money and any time you invest money you are expecting a return from your perspective this is relatively safe because you because the company is making a commitment that it will it will pay you but is this 100% safe it's not 100% safe because my company might go bust and i might default so there is still a risk but at least contractually i have told you that i will pay you a certain amount of money okay then i'll skip over to number 3 before coming to preferred stock another possibility might be that i say to you that look this this uh, factory that i am going to create is going to cost me 50 million dollars i will put in 30 million of my own so that's my own equity and then 20 million i might get from investors so that's you now in this particular case i will say to you that you give me 20 million and then every year from the profits i will give you 40% of the profit as an example okay so every year there will be a profit from this factory and i will give you 20% okay now are you taking any risk here you are taking more risk why because if there is no profit you get nothing am i contractually obliged to give you something no so here there is higher risk but potentially higher reward because if the company does very well then i have to make um, if if i make a ton of money then i have to give you 40% of the earnings so in common stock there is more risk but potentially more reward okay a uh, in between category is preferred stock where it is uh, where i might say that you buy a preferred stock let's say each each share is worth 100 so for every share you give me 100 and i tell you that for every share i will give you a preferred dividend of 12% okay now the way this dividend works is it is not necessarily a contractual obligation that i have to give you 12% but the way the market works is in a preferred dividend there is generally an expectation that the company will do it and this dividend has to be paid before anything goes out to the common shareholders okay so the reason preferred stock is called preferred is that the payout or the dividend is preferred or made before the payment is made to the common shareholders does this mean that the preferred stockholders are better off does this mean this is a better investment not necessarily, not necessarily. it is a safer investment the risk is lower because the payment happens here so why is the why is the term preferred used over here yeah because the the payment when a payment is made the preference or the is made to the preferred stockholders they get payment first they are taking less risk than the common stockholders so the expected return here will be less so if the company makes a ton of money and let's say that the company has issued debt issued preferred stock and issued common stock the debt holders will get their fixed 10% the preferred shareholders will get their fixed 12% and then common stockholders will get everything else if the company does great the common stockholders do very well and often this common stock or the is 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 called the residual interest residual because after the long term debt is paid off and the preferred shareholders are paid off what remains the residual is for the common shareholders uh, for the preferred stock is it 12% the value uh, the the return on on the 100 dollars or on the total profit as a company the 12% would be typically based on the par value so the par on the 100 okay so if i initially sell that share for 100 and call that the par value then the 12% is on that okay so uh, no there is more to it the the preferred shareholders get 12% of par value first the common shareholders will not necessarily have a fixed amount 
so whatever and we will see this in more detail later so common shareholders if the company makes a tremendous amount of money let me just give you a very simple example let's say the company makes a profit of 100 million okay and the the common shareholders let's say that the bondholders put in uh, actually rather than i'm i'll get i'm getting deeper into the lecture so this is two days worth of lecture so let's hold off on that and i will eventually answer that a quick final point on this slide is that in terms of the common stock there is a, a categorization called retained earnings and new common stock you have probably seen this in your accounting courses common stock refers to the money that shareholders have invested okay now broadly speaking there are two ways in which the owners can have invested one is the money that you have directly put in okay so for example when the company started shareholders might have put in a total of 50 million now a year later from the profits that were generated those profits could either be given out as dividends in which case that money leaves the company you as shareholders get the dividend and then you can do whatever you want with that dividend or the earnings can be put back into the company so you can say that i don't want the earnings i want to put that money back or i want to retain the earnings within the company and use that money to grow the company or do whatever so is that really your money that you are putting back in it is effectively your money so the earnings you can think of as as effectively belonging to the shareholders okay so the earnings belong to the shareholders those earnings now it's the shareholders who might decide that we don't want to take the money out we want to leave the money in the company so that indirectly is a way of shareholders putting their money back into the company so that is also considered equity and that type of equity where shareholders are simply saying okay the earnings are retained within the business that is called retained earnings sir but generally isn't it true that shareholders don't have the option of either getting dividends or using their profit as retained earnings okay so the question is generally do shareholders not have the option in a large company in a corporation these decisions are made by the board and uh, again very simplistically who does the board represent the board represents the the shareholders so at least uh, here at a simplistic level ultimately it is the choice of the shareholders so here i'm just giving you the big picture the nitty gritties we will be getting into over the course okay now a quick point on the sources of capital generally a uh, accounts payable accruals deferred taxes are not sources of funding that come from investors so they are not included in the calculation of cost of capital what does this little seemingly confusing phrase mean okay let me just tie this back to the previous slide what were the what were the sources of capital so what did i talk about in the previous slide three three sources of capital what were the three sources of capital i had uh, debt a preferred stock and essentially equity or common common stock okay what about so here is a question for you when a company buys raw material and the company doesn't pay for it immediately essentially it creates a payable okay so i buy $10000 worth of leather for my shoes but i tell my supplier that i'm going to pay you next year and the supplier let's say agrees is that a source of um, funding no no because that person have i not borrowed in a sense yeah so anyway so in a sense i have borrowed okay but generally when we talk about uh, sources of funding from investors a we we generally refer to funding or sources of funding to those items where the company has to pay a return okay so when i when i that's a simplistic definition so when i borrow money from investors 
when I issue a debt, do I need to pay a return? Yes. I need to. Preferred stock, I need to pay a return. Common stock, I need to pay a return through dividends. So when we are talking about financial capital that is being raised for long-term projects, we are referring to these three. Basically, the, ca the, the common theme across these three is that they are investors who need to be given a return. When we talk about suppliers so th uh, from whom we are getting uh, payables and so on, we don't need to pay them a, a return. So that's why we don't consider that as a source of long-term capital. Okay. The need for cost of capital to decide whether to go ahead with a certain... Yeah. Typically, typically, you don't pay your supplier's interest. Okay, anytime you're paying interest, then that can be considered a source of funding. But if I buy leather from my, from my leather provider, okay, typically I am, I am not paying him interest. Sir, does that mean inflation does not count in as a part of funding? Inflation, okay, so the question is, does inflation count as a part of funding or not? Now, obviously, the, the return that I'm going to pay or when you, when you lend me money, the rate that you are going to require will typically have inflation or expected inflation built into it. Okay, so if you know, just as an example, if you know that interest rate or the inflation rate is approximately 10% and you are lending me money, the return that you will demand should be more than 10%. Okay, so the inflation is so much a part of society that typically contracts when the terms are agreed upon, we uh, we build inflation numbers into our. Uh, so in case of raw materials, when I borrow like 12,000 rupees and I have to pay, like, let's say, after six months, I have to pay in like 15,000 rupees based on inflation. So the inflation comes as part of funding. So in that case, it would be a funding. Okay, let's not, let's not make things unnecessarily complicated. If my supplier, first of all, if most suppliers won't be willing to lend for that long but if my supplier is willing to do that that's good for me okay but normally suppliers will not especially in Pakistan will not will not say okay pay me after six months okay anyway so let's get back to this so the need for cost of capital to decide whether to go ahead with a certain project or not we need to compare the cost of capital with the return on capital when the return on capital is greater than the cost of capital, we go ahead with the project. So this actually is one of the most fundamental concepts when we talk about cost of capital. We are going to get into details, but let us just get a high-level picture here. Again, think of me as the company. When I raise money, be it through equity or be it through debt, okay, let's say that on average, when I raise money, I need to pay a return of 12%. What does this mean? So I, let's say on this side of the room are bondholders. On the, on the right side of the room are equity holders. For now, we'll assume there is no preferred stock. And how do I compensate the bondholders? Yeah, I pay an interest payment. It's in the bond world, it's called coupon payments. On the right... Uh, equity investors or stock investors, simplistically, how do I compensate you? Dividends. Through dividends. Okay, now let's say on average, and how do we calculate at average, that's what we will get to later, but for now, let's say on average, I need to pay 12%. Okay, that is called my cost of capital. Why? Because to raise my $100 million, I need to on average pay 12% for that. Now, if I am taking that 100 million and investing it in a project that gives me a return of 11%, does it make sense? No. So it is important for me to know my cost of capital because if I simply look at a project where I'm getting 11% and I'm ignoring my cost of capital, 11% might seem like a good number. Okay, but the 11% has to be looked at in, in context. And what's the context? The context is, okay, how much did it cost me to raise that money? If it costs me more to raise money relative to what I'm making on that money, then obviously 
doesn't make sense. All right, so I will I will not do a project where it costs me 12% to raise money, but only generates 11%. On the other hand, if I can get a project with a 15% return, then what will I do? Then, then it makes sense. So for me to run a project, do a project, my return on that project needs to be more than the cost of capital. So what this point emphasizes is the need to understand the the cost of capital and every company will have its cost of capital so when you go become a finance associate at ingro or ppl or some other large firm a relatively smart question to ask is what's the cost of capital around here okay so cost of capital sometimes is also called a hurdle rate why do you think it's called a hurdle rate Well, exactly. It's called a hurdle rate because you will only consider projects that is above that hurdle. Okay, so no project will be considered that is below that hurdle. So the cost of capital roughly is also referred to as a hurdle rate because to do a project you need to sort of be over that hurdle. Okay. Now we get into calculating the cost of capital. and a formula that all of you need to know very well and this is a guaranteed question on a quiz or a exam is the weighted average cost of capital why do we call this the weighted average cost of capital so because it's a combination of yeah it is uh, it is it is um, obviously in my simplistic example earlier i said we have debt holders or bond holders and equity holders and the cost of capital is based on the cost of debt and cost of equity now just intellectually at a high level if 90% of my funding is from debt 10% funding is from equity then it makes more sense to put 90% weightage on the cost of debt and 10% weightage on the on the cost of equity so that's why the overall cost of capital is called a weighted average cost of capital because it is weighted based on how much debt how much equity and then how much preferred stock okay and how do we express that so the weighted average cost of debt is the weight of debt times the rd stands for the rate that i need to pay or the cost of debt and then since debt is tax deductible i do a 1 minus t and if you don't understand why this happens let me know i can do a separate little segment on that plus the weight of preferred shares times the rate on preferred stock plus the weight of common stock times the rate on stock stock the term equity common stock shares will all be used interchangeably okay so as i said the w's refer to the firms target capital structure weights and i am going to explain this what do you think uh, have you have you heard the term capital structure what does capital structure mean you yeah, actually this this very simple way this capital structure is a fancy term for a very simple concept capital structure refers to what percentage of my funding is coming from debt versus what is coming from equity so one possible capital structure is that 60% of my money comes from common stock and 40% of my money comes from debt okay this is one possible capital structure another capital structure might be 50% from common stock 40% from debt 10% from preferred shares so these items represent sources of funding capital structure simply refers to what percentage of my funding is coming from what source okay that's my capital structure do you understand where the term why, why is it called capital structure capital is the money that i am raising the structure is simply saying where is that money coming from okay okay now the term target capital structure simply means and 
I am giving you something here that we will study in detail later in this course. A company might have a capital structure of 60% common stock or 60% equity and 40% debt, but the company might be moving towards a target of 50% common stock and 50% equity. Why? Because the company determines that maybe that is better for the company. Why is it better? That we'll study later. But this, in my simple example, on top what you see is the actual current present capital structure and the company might have a target that is different. When we use these weights, we are supposed to consider the target capital structure and not the actual capital structure. And for now, just take that as a, as a given. Okay. So, the R's refer to the cost of each component. Is that, what does that mean? So, those are the rates, the rate on debt, the rate on preferred shares and so on. Okay. Now, from the previous formula, uh, just as a quick refresher, uh, what do we need? So, to determine VAC, what, what are the, um, so what are the seven pieces of information that we need? You need the tax rate? You need the, you know, you need the three rates? And you need the three, so three weights in the target capital structure. Okay, so let's talk about, so obviously that means uh, the tax rate typically will be given, so that's relatively easy. So let's first talk about how we come up with the, with the three R's, okay, the cost of debt, the cost of preferred shares, and the cost of equity or cost of common stock. Okay. Another, so one core question before we get into the details is should we focus on historical cost or new cost? New cost is sometimes also called marginal and let me just explain this concept. Let's say that you are a company and up till now when you have borrowed money, you have paid 10%. This would be, this would be referred to as the historical cost of borrowing money. Okay, but if you go to your bondholders today or wherever you are borrowing money from, you are told that the cost of new money borrowed is 12%. Okay, so if you are given this piece of information, in your formula for RD, do you use, I will give you three options, okay, so, you know, in the CFA format, for example. So, should should cost of debt be A, 10%, B, 12%, or C, 11%? Do you understand the question? So the, so the question is this. I am giving you a scenario, and then I am asking you what cost of debt to use. The scenario is that up till now, whenever you have borrowed, you have paid a rate of 10%. Okay. But... Given the current state of your economy and the current state of your company, when you go to borrow today, the bank tells you or your investors tell you that, okay, we will lend to you, but at a rate of 12%. So that's this 12%. Now the question is, in the, in the WAC formula, the weighted average cost of capital formula, which number should I use? Should I use 10%, which is... 12% or 11%? Why should I use 12%? What does the target capital... I haven't even told you what the equity is. So what does the target capital structure have to do with... That means you're going to go about in the future exactly what your capital, the cost of capital should be. So 12% is the rate for the future. Okay. Good. So, so that part is correct. So the, the correct answer is that you should go with 12% because... That's what matters. Okay. So a lot of people might have been thinking 11%. How many people were thinking 11%? Okay. Yes. Okay. Would there be any scenarios in which we have to use the average of the No. The, look, look at it logically. If I were to borrow money today and my cost of borrowing money today is 12%, would I, would I do a project that would give me a return of 11.5%? No. So, for me, the, the relevant number is the number that is 
up f is, is in the future. And this brings a larger theme in finance. So another difference between finance people and accounting people. Accounting people count what's happened in the past. Finance people are concerned with what will happen in the future. Okay, because from an investment perspective, I know that my cost is 12%. That's the relevant number because I will only do projects that give me a return over 12%. If I said that my cost of capital is 11% based on an average, then based on that logic, I should select a project which gives me a return of 11.5%. But you are smart enough to realize that that will not make you money. Okay, so you only do things that that make you money and you will make money if your return is more than the cost of the 12 percent right but i'm uh, so you're mixing two things up so you're saying when the when the rate was 10 percent if the rate was also 12 percent Okay. Today, if you go into the market and see that rate is twelve uh, percent now, would that twelve percent apply to the previous loan too? No. The the thing about loans is typically in in our at least in our simplistic assuming we are talking about fixed rate loans, which is what I'm doing right now. Okay. If one year ago I made a contract with you that I'm going to pay a rate of ten percent. Okay, in my simplistic world right now, that 10% still holds. Okay, we get, can get into further complications where we have floating rate loans, which is actually what happens a lot, but I'm not, I'm still operating in a relatively simple world, so everybody understands the concept. Uh, sir, I have just, just two questions. Uh, when we're raising capital for a new project, right? So for the back equation, we include the previous stocks and bonds flow. Uh, when in in the VAC equation, the cost is based on the cost of raising new capital. Okay, so we don't include the stocks already. Included. We don't include the cost of stocks that have been already. already floated. So anyway, just make a note of this, and a lot of these things will become clear as you as you listen to you know the later slides and as you do problems. Right now, focus on new or historical costs. The cost of capital is used primarily to make decisions which involve raising and investing new capital. So we should focus on marginal costs or the costs up front. Okay. What is the marginal cost of new debt? Okay. Now we are going to now next few slides are going to be about calculating the cost of new debt. So what is the marginal cost of new debt? Let's say NCC is a company. Their bankers state that a new 30-year bond issue would require an 11% coupon rate. The embedded or historical cost may not be the same as the marginal cost. Okay. One question is, should our analysis focus on before tax or after tax costs? What does this mean? This essentially means that let's say that when we pay uh, interest rate, I'll just pick some numbers here. So let's say that the bank says that they will lend us money, but we need to pay a rate of 10%. Okay. Then let's say our tax rate is 30%. How many people know? that uh, interest payments are tax deductible. What does this mean? What does When we make a statement, interest payments are tax deductible, what does that mean? Let's say that we borrowed 100 million. If we borrowed 100 million, what is our interest payment? The interest is 10 million. Will this 10 million show up as an expense in our income statement? It will show up as an expense. So will that reduce our taxes? Yes. yes. Yeah. So when it shows up as an expense, it reduces our taxes. Is that a good thing? Yes. Yeah. Reducing taxes is a good thing. So since taxes are being reduced, 
that means our effective rate is less than 10 percent. Do you get what I'm saying? So, so I am paying a interest expense of 10 million. Because of that 10 million, my tax savings are 10 million into into 30 percent. Why? Because the 10 million will reduce my earnings before tax by 10 million. And that means the tax savings that I have are 10 into 30 percent, which is 3 million. So that means that net net, my cost is not really 10 million, but it's 10 minus the 3 million, which is 7 million. So effectively, my after tax cost of debt is really 7 percent. And what's a quick way of doing this? The quick way of saying is that the cost of debt after tax is equal to the cost of debt before tax into 1 minus the tax rate. In this particular example, the cost of RD was 10 percent. So if I do 10 percent into 1 minus the tax rate of 7 percent, I have uh, 10 into a 1 minus 0. 0. 0.3, which will give me 7 percent. So the after-tax cost of debt is what I really need to use. And you will keep seeing this uh, in, in the cost of debt formula. If you remember earlier, we had RD into 1 minus T. And this is where that is coming from. Okay, so we should focus on the after-tax capital because interest expense is tax deductible and results in tax savings. So the stockholders should focus on after-tax cash flow. So in our particular case, if we had 10 percent, here the tax rate is 40 percent. So in our WAC formula, we should use 6 percent. Okay, now the next question becomes, how do we figure out that RD? So how do we figure out RD? In a simple world, if you are just borrowing from a bank, then the RD will be obvious because the bank will tell you what the cost is. But what if you are issuing a bond? And how many of you have studied bonds before in, in IBF? I'm sure everybody has. The, the more relevant question is how many remember what you studied. Okay, so, so this will be a, a refresher. So let's say that you are issuing a new bond. The question is, what is the rate that your um, investors will demand? One way of finding out is you go ask a finance expert. Who's the typical finance expert? Your investment banker. Investment banker is the, the entity that will help you raise funds. So a, a year and a half ago when Engro issued the Engro Rupaya, they worked through some investment bank to issue that bond. So before they issued the bond, the investment bank would advise them in terms of what is an appropriate rate that investors will, will want or demand. So that's one method. Another is to find the bond rating for the company and use the yield on other bonds with a similar rating. Now this is a fairly deep statement. I'll just explain this also. Uh, are you aware that different companies have ratings? So you have rating agencies in Pakistan, you have agencies such as PACRA. Yeah. Globally, you have rating agencies such as Moody's and S&P. Yeah. So these are entities that give a credit rating to companies. Okay. Now, just uh, logically, if you are a company with a very good credit rating, we aren't going to get into details of credit ratings, but in credit rating, if you see lots of A's and pluses, so think of it like a grade. So A's and pluses are good. B's and C's and minuses are bad. Okay, so let's just take a triple A rated company. That's a, a top rating, very high rating. So let's say you are rated triple A, but you've not issued a bond. Another company also is rated triple A. And when that company issued a bond, it had to pay 8% to its investors. So you can make an assumption that, look, I'm also AAA. 
so if i issue a bond i'll also have to pay 8% so that is a another method just to check your understanding let's say that you are not triple a you are a triple b then will your rate that you need to pay be higher or lower yeah so if you have a lower rating the rate that you need to pay is higher why because the investor is taking more risk if the investor is taking more risk the investor will demand a higher return okay and the third method is the one that is most testable uh, requires calculation this is find the yield on a company debt which we will look at now okay let's say a company has a 15 year 12% semi annual coupon which sells for this amount what is the cost of debt okay now i'm going to refresh your memory in terms of simple uh, finance related to a bond first of all what does this mean what is not explicitly said here is a bond has a par value of 1000 do you i'm going to just check whether you remember this if i say a bond has a par value equal to 1000 what does this mean so so par value is equal to 1000 and i am saying that the market value or the amount that is selling for is 1153.72 i am saying a 12% semi annual coupon okay and it's a 15 year bond what do what do all these things mean first of all is it is it a typo that the par value and market value are different no. so, yeah it is selling at a premium so obviously you have seen that but what does this mean so currently if i want to if an investor wants to buy the bond how much will he have to pay par value or the market value he will pay market value and what is the cash flow that the investor will get so you are the investor i am the company so my bond is selling in the market for this much so if i were to issue a bond today one bond so this bond is a piece of paper so i am selling you this piece of paper and what is the promise i am making you so so for this piece of paper how much are you paying me you are paying me the value the market value okay now why are you paying me this money because the interest rate the market interest rate has to be lower than the bond no yeah no just logically pure without 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 trying to uh, you know draw on your partial memory of what you have studied just logically i am selling you this piece of paper we have agreed that you are giving me the market price why in your right mind would you give me this money i, I am giving you something okay exactly so in return i give you something so if we tie back to one of my or the, the first class if we were to do a uh, a timeline on this so zero and then let's say this is 0.5 since this is semi annual one what do these what do these points represent so each each 6 month period then this is 2 and we go on and on and when's the final period it's a 50 it's a 15 year bond what's each period over here yeah the final one is going to be 30 okay hmm it's a 15 year bond it's semi annual payments what does semi annual mean yeah so every 6 So if I sell the bond today, uh, sir, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when we have written point five and we have written thirty over there, it means a total of sixty periods, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're right. Good point. Yeah. So that's correct. No, that's correct. Good. Good point. So given given the convention that I've used, I'm using point five year, one year. If I were to write this in terms of uh, of periods, okay. So So then, in 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 blue, if I'm writing period, so then this would be zero, one, two, three, and then it would be thirty. Okay. So now, 
what happens at every so what are you what are you paying me initially so you are paying from your perspective you are making an investment of 1153 okay so the blue is what you gave me what am i supposed to give you So how much do I give you at the end of the first period? Yeah, so since this is 12% semi annual, that means per period we have 6%. So now do I pay you 6% of what? Yeah, I pay you 6% of par value. So how much am I giving you? 60. So every period I will give you 60. Anything else that I need to give you? Yeah. Plus, at the end, I need to give you the the thousand dollar par value. Okay. Now, you know how much you are giving me, and you know that over the next thirty periods or fifteen years, how much you are getting. Okay. So, given this, can you calculate what rate you, the investor, are getting? is the rate that you are getting is that the same as the cost to me why not isn't the 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 rate that you are getting who's giving you that rate i am giving you that rate right so the rate for you the investment return isn't it my cost Uh, right now i'm trying to create a simple problem but you are trying to make it hard uh, all, all all we are saying is if i sell you this pen for 20 rupees i get 20 rupees and you pay 20 rupees right in simple terms so if i am selling you a bond when we talk about selling a bond there is a cost to me which is uh, which is which is essentially the rate that i need to pay you a larger point with money borrowing money is like what so borrowing money means that uh, i am borrowing money from you and how do i pay for money the interest rate is how i pay for money so what i am paying you is my cost what you are getting is essentially your return it's the same thing for me rd is the cost as the company because i am raising money for you rd is the return because you are investing that money does it make sense okay so it's the same number it's just that for me it's a cost for you it is a return okay assuming here that investment bankers have not made any money in between so if your somebody had said it's different because there are these uh, rich bankers and the money who are taking a slice of that of of the financial transaction then it would have been correct but in our simple world where it's just between you and me my cost is your return so what is the next question what is that for you what is that in what is that return for me what is that cost how many people know how to solve that we have one we have only one unknown so you know how much you are investing and you know what is the amount you are investing how much is your investment yeah 1153 and what's your what are you getting all this cash flow in red and so can you calculate your return okay so the way it will be about 5 point uh, 5 point something per period or per year okay now actually to do this calculation you either need a financial calculator or you need to use formulas or you need to use a computer okay i will just show you conceptually you've understood this let me just uh, uh, let me show you what is stated here so 
the bond pays a semi annual rate so the so actually this is a a, a, a typo it should be 6% okay so in a financial calculator just by the way those who end up using it this is what we would input we would put in 30 periods okay we would uh, what is the what is the cost of debt okay we would actually plug in um, all the figures on top is what you plug in the figure at the bottom is what the calculator gives you so you plug in this many periods 30 periods you plug in what is the present value present value is the investment that you've made you plug in a payment of 60 payment is the the equal payment and then you plug in the future value which is the which is the money that you will get back at the end and you ask the calculator to compute a rate this 5% is the rate for what so so the 5% would be the uh, is the rate for a 6 month period or the one year 6 months so then how would you come up for one year so if that's for 6 months so for multiplied by 2 that's this 10% does everybody get that? Okay, now I am not uh, going to expect you to have a financial calculator, but I am going to expect two things. One is the cash flow that I just showed you. You need to be able to come up with that cash flow. The other is just to check your understanding. I might give you something like this. I might say that you are a company, for example, and you issue a bond. The bond when you issue is issued at uh, let's say 950 what does that mean so you issue a bond for 950 so this is uh, so you issue it at 950 and you tell your investor that after after 2 years you will give the investor back a 1000 dollars so if you are telling that you will give your investor back a thousand dollars after two years, right now it's been issued for nine fifty. What is RD? Can you calculate this? What's your cost of debt? Do it. So this is just um, some basics. So do this. the question that's even more disappointing what 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 have you understood so far what uh, just try to repeat so okay that's an approximation okay but uh, what was again somebody so we at the back what uh, so what's your name no no not this umar what is what's the question? What have I asked you to do? What rate? Okay, so Hamza, can you clarify what? So the company, what is the cash flow first of all? Can somebody say? Let's say you are the company. Okay, so if you are the company, <laughs> this is zero. Year one and year two. What's the cash flow from the company perspective at year zero? Plus nine fifty. And what's the cash flow over here? M minus thousand. And what am I asking you? Is the company paying a rate? Yeah, because the company is getting nine fifty, but it's paying back more. So I am asking, what's the what's that rate? Now, is this a, am I, when we calculate RD, is RD an annual rate or a rate for two years? Yeah, when you say my cost of debt, it's, it's for a one-year period. Okay. So, now, how do you calculate what that one-year interest rate is? So, effectively, 
it's like saying okay i borrowed 950 i need to pay back 1000 what's my annual rate the if you tie back to your present value future value all all you can say is 950 into 1 plus that rate squared is equal to 1000 okay can you do it from here yes okay All right, yeah. So it's a standard. Hmm? So what's the question? Or do you understand what my question was? My question was: You are a company. You borrow nine fifty, and you tell me, the investor, that after two years you are going to pay me a thousand. So the question here is that effectively what? what rate are you paying what's your interest rate what's your annual interest rate so there is nothing to complicated here at all what what rate is 950 exactly so i am not doing any charity here i am saying okay i'll lend you 950 but you give me back 1000 after 2 years so then all i'm asking is what what rate are you paying okay so did everybody get this so there is nothing now this doesn't require a financial calculator it doesn't require a, a spreadsheet it doesn't require memorizing any formulas but it requires that you understand the concept okay so that's what i'll be after on the exam okay if you don't get the concept you'll have problems okay but in your homeworks and in your spreadsheet problem you need to be able to learn how to use the the spreadsheet okay So next, we have a component cost or debt continued. So let's say that we 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 always use the cost or debt. What do you think AT means after tax? So that's the cost or debt before tax into one minus the tax rate, which is ten percent into one minus point four, which is six percent. in this particular case we are ignoring flotation cost flotation cost you can think of as all the other costs associated with issuing debt the money that you pay investment bankers and so on and so forth so at this stage we are ignoring that so our cost of debt is 6% okay so in the formula what have we done so far we have figured out our cost of debt and 1 minus t so we figured out this thing just in these slides uh, just assume that k and r are the same thing so sometimes we say k for cost and sometimes we say r for rate so don't get confused it's just uh, whatever so they are the same thing okay now what we are going to talk about is the cost of preferred stock okay which is fairly straightforward again rp is the marginal cost of preferred stock the rate of return investors requ require on the firm's preferred stock so a company has issued preferred stock this rp is the rate that investors require on preferred stock and the way this works is relatively straightforward if i issue a preferred stock with par value equal to 100 and what i say is that the dividend that i'm paying you is is $12 so if i'm paying you $12 every year and the investment that you made per share is 100 what's the rate that you are getting the rate that you are getting is simply the 12 divided by 100 is that assuming no flotation cost is that my cost the rate that you are getting is that the same as the cost that i am paying yes yeah so the rate that you are getting is is the cost for the company so that is the cost of preferred stock so in the case of our company if we say that the dividend is 10 and the cost of the preferred share that investors are paying is 111 then in this particular example the cost of preferred shares equals 
9%. All right, preferred shares are not tax deductible. What does that mean? When you, when you do your income statement, in the income statement, do you subtract interest expense, the interest paid on bonds? You subtract that. Interest expense shows up in your income statement. So as I, as I discussed earlier, since the interest expense shows up on the income statement, it is tax deductible. That means that it reduces your taxes. Have you ever seen preferred dividend payment as part of your income statement? No. no. So that means that the preferred dividend is not reducing your tax. Since the preferred dividend is not reducing your tax, therefore in the formula you will just see the preferred dividend being used. You don't have any 1 minus t, so there is no uh, 1 minus t after the preferred dividend because the preferred dividend does not reduce your tax. So if you are paying a rate of 12%, then that is the rate that you are paying. There is no tax benefit. Okay. And in our case, we are assuming flotation costs. If there uh, no flotation costs, if there are flotation costs, we adjust for them. Okay, the last point here is preferred stock more or less risky than debt? For a, for a investor perspective, the, the preferred stock is more risky. Why? Because from a company perspective, who do I need to pay first? I first need to pay the bondholder. Okay, for the money that I make, I first have to pay the bondholder. Then if I have money left, I pay the preferred. So who's taking more risk between the bondholder and the preferred? Preferred is taking more risk. So firms try to pay, uh, but in any case, firms try to prefer the, uh, to pay the preferred dividend. Uh, otherwise, they cannot pay common shareholder dividend. This means that common shareholders only get money after the preferred shareholders. If a company develops a reputation that it's not paying the preferred shareholders, then that makes it very difficult for the company to raise money in the future. And preferred shareholders don't normally control the company. The company is controlled by common shareholders. But if a company does not make payments to preferred shareholders, then simplistically put, preferred shareholders can have an option of taking over the company.